ordained by Archbishop Desmond Tutu, becoming his friend and colleague and confidant, and invited to work with the Desmond and Leah Tutu Legacy Foundation, Father Edwin Arison's life has been one of service and commitment to carry on the Arch's theological, political, and spiritual legacy. As one of the leaders of South Africa's anti-apartheid movement, imprisoned twice for his activism, Edwin is a leader of Cairo, South Africa, and was also instrumental in the writing of Cairo, South Africa's 30th anniversary statement, Dangerous Memory and Hope for the Future. Like Archbishop Tudu, he has stood in solidarity with his sisters and brothers in Palestine in their struggle against the illegal and immoral Israeli settler colonial regime and worked closely with Cairo, the leaders of Kairos Palestine as they developed their seminal 2009 Kairos Palestine document. He now works with leaders of the Kairos movement around the world in the Global Kairos for Justice Coalition. For answering the gospel call for nonviolent resistance and the prophetic struggle against apartheid in all its forms in South Africa, Palestine, and around the world, Indiana Center for Middle East Peace expresses its profound gratitude for the life and work of Reverend Edwin Arison and presents to him its 2022 Champion of Justice Award. Thank you. I'll let you hold that and they're going to take a picture off the top. Out. Uh, thank you for your warm welcome. Uh, last night uh, we were welcomed at the home of a family, it's a Jude and Jay, and we had a wonderful evening together. And I, I said to some people tonight that I already feel very welcome here. So thank you for your warm Indiana hospitality. This is not my first time in Indiana. I came to um, Indianapolis in 2017 to bring some young people from South Africa uh, who would be Desmond Tutu Youth Fellows. And so tomorrow I will go back to to Indianapolis uh, to meet with, with people there. So thank you, thank you. It's wonderful to be with you. I, I have prepared a whole text, but I, I don't think I'm gonna read it. I, I'm a very bad, I'm a very bad reader of texts. So I enjoy telling stories. And I think I'll rather do that tonight. But I, I come to you from the southernmost part of Africa, a long way. I come, from you to, I come to you from a place where the cradle of humankind is located. I come to you from a place where the Indian and the Atlantic Oceans meet, from the Cape that is called both the Cape of Good Hope and the Cape of Storms. <laughs> and I come to you from this place that has produced the most incredible human beings and humanity. Where, where else in the world where would a Nelson Mandela and a Desmond Tutu be produced at the same time? So we have been privileged to live amongst giants in, 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 the, in the most literal sense of that word. People who have inspired us and certainly 
have inspired me for so many years. I met Desmond Tutu in 1985, 37 years ago. And I will never forget the first time I heard him speak at a, a rally for young white conscripts in South Africa, people who refused to serve in the South African Defense Force because they refused to cooperate with the policy of apartheid, with the apartheid regime. And Desmond Tutu was there to encourage them. And as he spoke, and as he, as he ended his speech, he, he lifted both hands, and I could literally feel him lifting me out of my seat. And, and I could sense the strong spirit, the strong charisma that is within him. And later that year, I would be at an event where he would hand over the position of General Secretary of the Council of Churches, the National Council of Churches. He would hand that position over to someone called Bayers Nodier. I don't know if any of you heard of Bayers Nodier, but Bayers Nodier was an Afrikaner who had turned his back on apartheid. <laughs> a very prominent Afrikaner, I must say, because Bayrus Nadir was on his way to becoming the moderator of the Dutch Reformed Church, and he was on his way to becoming the Prime Minister of South Africa, of apartheid South Africa. And he turned his back on that, and the regime then banned him for several years. And only when they unbanned him could he take up the position of General, General Secretary of the South African Council of Churches. And I was in the room when this happened. And Desmond Tutu walked in, as he, as he normally did, with a crowd of people with him. And there was a bit of a buzz in the room when he did that. And he walked to the front and he said, he said, you know, we black people, we are crazy. We are crazy. He said, look what we are doing today. We are handing over this very senior church position. As a, as a black bishop, I'm handing it over to this white Afrikaner. He says, we are crazy, crazy. And then he stopped and he said, actually, we are all black. All of us. Some of you just came out of the oven sooner than some of us. <laughs> and with those words, he handed over to Bayer Snodier and he left the room. This was in 1985. He was elected Bishop of Johannesburg and he had to vacate the position of General Secretary. Now, remember, a year before that, he had won the Nobel Peace Prize in 84. So, 84, he won the Nobel Peace Prize. 85, he was elected Bishop of Johannesburg. 86, he was elected Archbishop of Cape Town. The first black Archbishop of Cape Town. And he said to me one day, he said, you know, things happened so fast during that time. I was lying in my bed next to Leia one night, and I said to her, Leia, you must be careful. Things are happening so fast. Uh, tomorrow morning, you might wake up next to the Pope. <laughs> this was... This was in 1985, and so 86, he became Archbishop, and he became Archbishop um, at the time when, when I was in prison. He came to Cape Town, he was, he was made Archbishop on 7 September 1986, 
and I was released on the 9th of September. The regime knew that I, 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 I was an ordinant at the time, and someone who was preparing for the priesthood, and they knew that I would have wanted to be at the consecration of the new Archbishop. But they, they were spiteful, of course, uh, because I had given them a bit of a hard time in prison. I won't tell that story again tonight. And they released me on 9 September. And I began to work very closely with him. So the following year, 87, was the first time that I actually was in the same room with him. Uh, he, he was there to select uh, young people or some of us for the priesthood. And he had to interview us. And as I walked into his room, he had a big pack of crisps with him. And he could see I was quite nervous, of course. And he, and, and he offered me the, the, the crisps. And he said, would you want some? Please sit down. And he, he interviewed me. And at the end of that weekend, I was selected to start my theological studies at the beginning of 1988. And so after a few years of studies and going off to the UK to study as well, I was ordained in 1992, both as a deacon in April 92, and then also as a priest in December 92. So this year, I will celebrate my 30th anniversary as an ordained priest. Thank you. Uh, when we celebrate our 20, my 25th anniversary, uh, he, was, he was with us. And some of those pictures um, shows a little bit of my engagement with him over the years. And as he moved towards retirement, um, and, and he, he, he could never retire, actually. He, he tried to retire several times. But as he retired as Archbishop of Cape Town, uh, President Mandela approached him and asked if he would share the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Some of you might know about the work of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And what was significant about that was that he held the pain of the nation within himself as he listened to the pain that was inflicted on the victims. For him, the victim was always the most important. But for him also, it was also important that the humanity of the oppressor also be recognized, acknowledged, and respected. He would always say to us, oh, you must be nice to white people. They need you for their salvation. And, and, and I think we, we, wanted, we wanted him to show us what that looks like. And he was very clear that after having been in leadership in, this, in the country during the time when Mandela was in prison, he was very clear that he did not want to continue that when the political prisoners were freed. There was a bishop in, in Zimbabwe, just north of us, called Bishop Mozarewa. And Bishop Mozarewa had challenged Robert Mugabe for the presidency in Zimbabwe. And there was a fear that Tutu would do the same to Mandela. But Tutu was very clear. He said, I was only a placeholder. That's all that I was. I was, I was a leader because the leaders were either imprisoned, or they were killed, or they were in exile. And that's simply why I was the leader. But once it became possible for the leaders, the political leaders to speak, he stepped back. But he became a voice of conscience even to those leaders. Because Alan Busak reminds us, 
and and I know that that he has also received this award and I spoke to him earlier this week and he said to me well he's very happy to be in such illustrious company and and I, I said well actually doc it's the other way around and Alan Busak reminds us that Pharaoh looks like us nowadays. Pharaoh is our family. And so what do we do when Pharaoh looks like you? When those who are in power is, is part of who you are and part of your family, how do you address them? Desmond Tutu showed us the way that justice is for all and is indivisible. Human rights are for all and it's indivisible. There are no borders for human rights. Human rights is universal and it has to be applied to all. And so one of the most important things that the arch taught me certainly was that the struggle is a long struggle. Evil is very creative. And evil will find a way to constantly regenerate itself. And so we who are in the struggle for goodness, we have to be as wise as serpents and as gentle as doves. We have to be able to sustain ourselves in the struggle. And Michael Battle, one of you, one of you are friends with Michael Battle. He's the author of, of this book on the spiritual life uh, of Desmond Tutu. Michael Battle came to South Africa to, to do his PhD on the Ubuntu theology of Desmond Tutu. And Archbishop Tutu came to me and he said, please, would you, would you accompany this young man? Would you please help him? Because he wants to be ordained in Cape Town as well. And so I agreed to have Michael Battle in my house for six months. And so we spent many hours talking about the, the theology and the spirituality of the arch. And then that one year, we, we decided we were going to ask the Arch if he could come and do the, the Christmas Day service at our li little church. And when I say little church, I mean uh, 300 people. I mean the poorest people in the Diocese of Cape Town. And so we went to the arch and we said, would you come and do the service on Christmas Day? And the arch agreed to do it. He said, yes, of course I'll come. I don't have anything in my program. Just tell my secretary to put it in my diary. I will be there. And so on Christmas Day, the arch arrives at this little church. People are very excited because the arch has never come to visit them. So this is the first time that he's there in their in, in their parish. And I don't remember the whole sermon, but I remember how he spoke to the people that day. And the first thing he said to them, he said, he said, all of you sitting here, all of you, you are simply a kettle. You know what a kettle is? Yeah? You are simply a kettle. And the people looked at him and they thought, what is this man saying? And then he said to them, but a kettle means nothing if it is not filled with water. Hmm? So pray to God that you will be filled with God's living water. And you could see people warming up. Okay, it's beginning to make more sense now. I'm a kettle. I must be filled with water. And then he said, 
But even then it means nothing. You're a kettle with water in. You must be plugged into a power source. And then you could see people getting excited. Yes. And of course, for those of us who are Christian, the power source is God's Holy Spirit. We must be plugged into this power source. And then he said, and then you must ask God to switch you on. <laughs> it's only then that you will be able to do what a kettle is supposed to do. And I, I take that as a very serious lesson for myself even. I pray on most days. I say to God, please fill me with your living water. Please plug me into you, if it is your will. Please switch me on. And I, I believe that as people who are fighting and working and practicing justice and peace every day, we need to be plugged into this power source and we need to ask God to switch us on every single day. Because the evil that we face is bound to break us down. It's bound to, to pull our energy out of us. And it's important that we have this discipline. And this is my final story about the arch. And then I'll speak about Kairos, South Africa and Kairos, Palestine. The arch has a daily discipline of, of celebrating the Holy Eucharist. A daily discipline. And I can tell you about that because he lived close to my house and during the COVID period, I looked after them. And I would, on many days, I would be alone celebrating the Holy Eucharist with them. Sometimes with him alone, sometimes with him and his wife, Mamalea. And he was very disciplined about this. And, it, and he's, he did this for something like 60 years, every single day. He would celebrate the Eucharist. And people sometimes ask, but why is this necessary? And the necessity is in this. It's not so much in this actual taking of bread and wine every day. But what it does is that it goes through a process, a threefold process. And this is what this book is about. A threefold process of purgation, of illumination, and of union, which is a mystical cycle. Purgation means you must be cleansed. You must be purged. And so he would go through a daily process of purging. Because you can just imagine the kind of life that he lived, the kind of spirituality that he had, that on any one day he would be concerned about Burma, about Tibet, about the Cypriots, about people in Western Sahara, people in Zimbabwe, people in Brazil. On any one day, he would, he would see the evil around the world and it becomes a part of you and particularly standing also for freedom and justice for the people of Palestine and being accused of being anti-Semitic because of that. And so he would go through that, that process of being purged every day and then to be illuminated through God's word. That means reading of the scriptures. And I, I would go there and I would think of perhaps skipping one of the readings and he would stop me and said, you must make, do all the readings every day. And having enough time for silence, and then, and then the actual act of breaking the bread, blessing the wine, receiving communion, becoming united with God, and then starting his day after that. And this was part of his daily rhythm. And part of, part of his daily rhythm 
was to have at least between four and six hours of silence per day, per day. And so when people talk about Bishop Tutu, Archbishop Tutu, and what he did in the world, it was because he was connected to something much bigger than himself. And he was not only connected, he was also disciplined about that daily practice. And because he was so disciplined, he was able to live this life of utter joy. At the end of the day, he could have the Dalai Lama as his BFF. Huh? Uh, and the two of them could be like two naughty boys. And they could spread the word of joy to people across the globe. Friends, I can speak here about him for the whole night, as you can imagine. But I won't say much more about him for now, except to say how he related to both Kairos, Southern Africa, and to Kairos, Palestine. The, one of the unique fe features of the arch was that he was both archbishop, in other words, he was both very, he was very institutional, and he was on the street. And he was able to hold this together. Not many of us can do that. Not many of us can be in the institution and, and, and work within the institution and at the same time be on the street. Not many of us can do that and have the respect of both. But he was able to, to do that. And so when we launched the Kairos document in South Africa in 1985, he was on his way to be elected as the Archbishop of Cape Town. And we could not disturb that process for him. And what we did was to critique state theology. We critiqued what we call church theology. And this was the most important part of the Kairos document in South Africa. The Kairos document had a had a, a, a heading called Moment of Truth and a subheading that said a challenge to the churches. A challenge to the churches. And what the Kairos document was, was a communal process of a letter from a Birmingham jail that Martin Luther King wrote as an individual. What we did was to make sure that people are together thinking about how it is that a Christian government can hold Christians in jail on Christmas Day, which is what happened in my case. How is it that the Christian government can kill Christian children on the streets of South Africa? They claim to be Christian. And then how is it that the church can be either silent or wanting to be neutral? And how is it that the, the, the words such as reconciliation can be made to be meaningless? In other words, that you, you almost want to be able to reconcile good and evil, justice and injustice. The Bible doesn't speak like that. You must remove injustice. And you must let justice flow like a river. But that's what the churches want to do often. The churches often want to want to try to bring injustice and justice together, bring good and evil together, somehow. And so the Kairos document was very clear in its critique of that kind of neutrality. Tutu would say, if an, if an elephant stands on the, on the tail of a mouse, and you come and say, well, I'm neutral to the mouse. The mouse will not particularly appreciate your, your neutrality. <laughs> and God is a God who takes sides. 
The Kairos document makes it very clear that God did not say to the, uh, to the slaves in Egypt, Oh, um, yeah, I think you're okay where you are. No, God said, I will set my people free. God takes sides. God is not a neutral God. And so what the Kairos document in South Africa then proposed was prophetic theology. And Albert Nolan, who really was one of the key authors of the document, he passed away last week at the age of 88. Albert said, he said, I define prophecy as afflicting the comfortable and comforting the afflicted. We afflict the comfortable. Get you out of your comfort zone. And those who are being affected by what you do, our job is to comfort them. Our job is to console them. Our job is to say, we are on your side. And this is what the Kairos document in South Africa then did. And so when the Kairos document hit the churches, and not only South Africans, but globally, it really made news. It woke up the churches because theology was then no longer the stale uh, German uh, exercise, but it was a living, breathing action that made people come alive and that gave people hope. And that's ultimately what the Kairos document did. And in South Africa, of course, in, I, I, I nowadays say it was actually easy. Because the ones who were our oppressors, they claimed to be Christian. And so how do you, how do you stand up against a Desmond Tutu who is also a Christian? And against an Alan Busak, who is also a Christian, against the Frank Chikani, who is also a Christian, against the Bayes Nodir, who is also a Christian, and so on and so forth. How do you do that? It's not possible. And eventually, the wall of apartheid came down just as the Berlin Wall came down. And we were able to say in South Africa, we, we, even today we say to the world, we actually witnessed evil coming to an end. We actually witness this. We are now not simply advocates, advocates for justice, advocates for peace. We can be that, but we are witnesses. We experienced it and we can tell you about it. And we can inspire others to do that. And that's exactly what we did for the Palestinian Christians. In 2009, they approached us and they said, we would like to reflect theologically like you did. And we would also like to write our own Kairos document. And I was one of those people who traveled to Bethlehem to meet with the Palestinian Christians and to help them to reflect on their particular situation. And I'm not going to bore you with that because I think you know what is happening. I think you understand that the situation that is happening in Palestine right now is one that we have to, we don't have a choice actually, one that we, uh, Bonhoeffer would say, we have to put a spoke in the wheel. That's what we have to do. Um, Bonhoeffer was the German theologian who, who worked against Nazism. And in the same way that we worked against Nazism and against apartheid in South Africa, we have to work against apartheid in Israel and in Palestine today. We, we South Africans, and you can listen to to Desmond Tutu. Desmond Tutu spoke together with Jimmy Carter about this. And he said, it is actually worse than apartheid in South Africa. So when we say 
that what is happening there is like apartheid, we're actually making a very mild statement. We're making a very moderate statement. Because there was never a time when bombs were being thrown on us in South Africa in the way that is happening in Gaza. Never. But it's happening today. And the people of Gaza, the people of the West Bank, um, have become targets. And they, 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 the, the weapons are being tested on them before it, it goes anywhere else. And they are today living in this open-air prison uh, that is Gaza and, and Palestine today. And so we have no choice. And particularly those of you in the United States, you know that your tax dollars are being used to finance the occupation. You know that. You know that the weapons going there are being produced here. You know that. We'll have to find ways to get the message through to those who are responsible for this democracy. And if the, the message cannot get through, then citizens will have to organize themselves to be able to get the message through. And I'm saying this because we all know that power does not, does not give itself up. Power does not, does not ever voluntarily relinquish itself. Power has to be taken from them. And so we, the people, we, the citizens, will have to say that we are people who will work for justice. And if you are a person of faith, you will also say, my faith will carry me through this forever and ever. The Holy Spirit will carry me through this for a long time. And the word impossible does not exist. Nothing is impossible for God. So we as Christians will have to say that we will take our faith with us and we will go and confront the evil that keeps the system of injustice and hypocrisy in place and we will defeat that system. As Desmond Tutu would say, evil will never have the last word. Goodness and justice and compassion and peace will always have the last word. Always. And if, the, if that is not the last word, then we have not arrived at that place yet. And so we South Africans, the Palestinians, people like yourselves, people in Europe, People on the rest of Africa, of the African continent, people in New Zealand, people in Australia, people in Brazil, we all have to hold hands and once again launch a global anti-apartheid movement like we had with the South African struggle. We have no choice but to do that. And when I say that, I say it with, with much gratitude, actually, because there were people standing at the embassy in London, in front of the South African embassy in London, in Trafalgar Square. They were standing there 24-7, in the cold, in the rain. They loved South Africa dearly, and they loved the people of South Africa dearly. And I've been at different places where I've seen that kind of positive energy from people who said, I was determined that the system of apartheid will come down. And it happened. And today, we have to recommit ourselves to that. We have to say to ourselves, the system of apartheid in Israel and in Palestine, once again, being justified by 
the Bible. Once again, once again, the Bible is used as a weapon against suffering people. Once again, we have to say no. The Bible and theology and spirituality and faith will not be abused and misused in this way ever again. And that is where I stand. I will stand for that and I will stand on that ground until that system comes to an end. And friends, let me, let me conclude. I can go on forever. Let me conclude by saying if we connect the dots, if we hold on to one another, if we build friendships, if we build trust, if we build relationships, if we support one another, if we do that, we can go marching into a future of goodness, of beauty, of compassion, of joy. We can. And we will see a new heaven and a new earth. That is what we will see. God's kingdom will come on earth as it is in heaven. May God bless you. Amen. Amen.